Hello everyone, uh, good evening and a very warm welcome to uh, the Art Spaces uh, fourth talk from the series. And uh, today's talk is titled Leaves and Thread Conversations with Nature. And our guest speaker for this evening is uh, Susanna Bauer from the UK. And uh, Thank you, thank you uh, so much uh, to everyone who, who are joining us today. Uh, I know some of you uh, have um, attended our previous talks. And as you know, this talk series is a part of the ongoing exhibition, uh, Crafting the Crossroad, that is currently on display at the Art Space in Hyderabad um, in India. Um, so, um, as we already uh, have uh, three presentations uh, in previous weeks. Uh, today we have Susanna with us and we'll be talking to her. We'll uh, know about her practice, uh, the kind of intricate work that uh, she does. We'll know about that. We'll, I know all of you have many, many questions to ask her. So, um, I, I won't take much time, but before I uh, go to Susanna and request her to do the presentation, I'll invite um, Ms. Bhargavi Gundala, the director of the art space, to say a few words about the exhibition, about uh, the stock series that we are currently hosting. Over to you, Bhargavi, ma'am. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it is uh, such a pleasure to host. Uh, Susanna's work. So this particular talk, Leaves and Threads, Conversation with Nature by Susanna, her work, you know, reminds me of such, uh, you know, in uh, our uh, Indian scriptures and uh, uh, Indian belief systems, we believe in next life. So while uh, I mean, whenever I see her work, you know, especially when I see her work, you know, her practice rather, it talks about so much of uh, conversations with nature. You know, when we believe in next life, she's actually creating that next life. She's actually bringing that next life into uh, in evidently seen. And uh, I mean, you will, you will witness it very soon in her talk. And uh, thank you so much, Susanna, for being part of this uh, Crossing the Crossroad, and it, which has been highly appreciated. The show has been highly appreciated. We got many comments and many messages from uh, across the country, like uh, uh, to name some. You know, we had uh, today morning, I had received a message from Jyotinder Jain, who's an art historian in India, who said, you know, working extremely brilliant and you know thanks for bringing her to the show and uh, to tell you all she's first time participating in India and uh, thank you Susanna and welcome for this day to the uh, talk and over to you sure thank you uh, Bhargavi ma'am and as uh, thank you very much uh, as, as Ms. Gundala mentioned, that this is uh, Susanna's first show in India. So we, we are very excited to have her work in the show. And uh, finally, the show happened. And now the conversation, in, in a few minutes, we'll start the conversation. So Susanna, welcome. Um, I know you know the, the people, people who follow your work on your social media pages, they just don't need any introduction of you because you're, they are just in love with your uh, work and practice so but uh, for them who are uh, joining us today for the first time and who will be seeing Susanna's practice for the first time today I would like to just read out a few lines uh, just to tell them uh, uh, who Susanna is uh, so Susanna Bauer is a UK-based artist who was born in Eichstatt, uh, Germany uh, she completed her edu education in landscape architecture um, from Munich in 1992, and then uh, uh, she has exhibited her works ex extensively throughout Europe and uh, America. Uh, to date, uh, Bauer has seven solo shows to her credit, 
The most recent one is uh, the LEAF 106 um, plus in Takamatsu, Japan. In her nearly two decade long career, she has extensively exhibited her work in major art galleries, institutions, and art fairs. Uh, her artworks were featured in uh, many publications, major publications, such as Guardian, Observer, Politiken, Sculpture Magazine, Le Soleil, uh, and many, many others. Uh, the list is quite long, actually. Uh, so presently, uh, she lives and works in Somerset, UK. So that is like a very formal introduction uh, of Susanna. Uh, welcome, Susanna, and over to you now. We're all... Hey all eagerly waiting to uh, see your work, your practice. You're welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank, to thank uh, you, Samadita Malik and uh, Bhagavi Gundala very much for inviting me to join this show. When uh, I got contacted, um, I instantly loved the uh, the topic of the exhibition, that, that crossroads. Um, because my work very much sits at this crossover point between art and craft. And I have always wondered about whether we actually need a distinction between art and craft, because I think um, the two go very much together. And I think uh, traditional craft techniques always come with stories, with personal inputs, and uh, instantly make a handmade piece very, very special whatever it is, whether it's just a ceramic bowl or a woven cloth, everything speaks. The personality of the maker always speaks through. Um, I will start sharing my screen now and um, to talk about my work and, um, so that you can see some images. I hope this works. I hope you can see this now. Um, yeah, my materials as you know, are leaves and thread, cotton thread I work with. And um, the way I've structured my talk is I'm gonna start a little bit about, start talking a bit about how I found my way to working with leaves, what comes, what came before that. And then I will show um, several examples of my work, different lines of, of my uh, compositions. This is me working in my studio, and um, as Samudita has already mentioned, uh, I had the path to me becoming an artist went via different different lines. I, as a child, I already began working with crafts. I've, my grandmother was a seamstress, my mother was a very keen knitter. So I've always been surrounded with thread, wool, fabrics, and I've learned at a very early age how to crochet, how to knit and how to make things. And I've always done it throughout my, uh, throughout my life. I've always also enjoyed working very small, working with miniatures. I used to make little landscapes with paper into matchboxes. So I've always had an affinity to working very fine. And parallel to that was always a love for plants, for nature, for gardening. And uh, that eventually took me to studying landscape architecture after, after my school education. And, but the, the actual love of making was always there and that then eventually took over and I trained as a model maker and I worked for film and advertising for many, many years, specializing in miniature. So I've, for over 20 years, I've worked very, very fine on all different aspects of model making for film, advertising, architecture. But I've also never stopped making my own work. I've always done my craft projects. I've always done art projects for myself. And I wanted to get to give this some more time. So I went to art school while still working as a model maker. So I combined the two. Initially, just to give space and time to my own creativity. And uh, out of that course, came what I've been doing for the last 15 years. So I will now start to talk about um, how my work came about. Initially, I was interested very much in contrasting materials. I did a lot of uh, objects purely based on material experimentation, on combining materials, like in this piece, it's different types of, well, it's actually one type of wood, but it's in different stages of decomposition. 
Um, you can see there's been parts of it have been eaten by woodworm and there's a, a, there's some rape and there's aluminium and uh, I like the dialogue between the materials, just the thoughts and, and, and images that come purely through the material language that come together in this piece. Here's another experimental piece where I've combined uh, crochet, which, as I said before, I've been doing all my life. These are crocheted half uh, like half discs uh, in mohair, so very, very soft to the touch, very, very gentle, combined with hard and cold cement and concrete. And the um, size of it is that they fit easily in a, in a palm, so they're nice to hold and touch. They're very tactile pieces as opposed to um, the leaves which are uh, all protected behind frames. So this is what came before. I've, I've been interested in material experimentation. And then one particular project at college really sparked off a whole different line for me. It was called Container of Experience. And this picture is actually from that project all those years back in 2007. And the Container of Experience project was um, a very loose brief and it was about holding and presenting experiences and for me the holding the containing happened with what I've been doing and I've had with me all the time is is thread wool crochet so I've to phrase it simply the container of experience is an ongoing project of containing objects that represent a memory and a moment in time Meditations about nature, personal collection, connection, fragility and the beauty that surrounds us. And in essence, this is still what I'm working with. So the first object that I took, it comes from, came from a walk on the beach. Pebbles, stones that I wanted to contain, take out of their normal, of the usual cycle of being washed in and out of the sea. And I've contained it in a way that for me represented very much that walk and that memory of that particular time. And the others were um, branches, bits of driftwood I found, or a, and a piece of uh, a log that I got that was collected in the woods and was chopped up and actually meant to go on the fire. And I took that out of the log basket, crocheted around it. And for me, that meant containing and keeping that moment in time. So that was the beginning of that connection of bringing, bringing back materials that meant something for me out of nature, out of experiences I had um, going out in nature. And at that time, I lived in London, in the middle of London, in a very busy, busy world. I was working as a model maker, but my partner, who uh, is also an artist, was in Cornwall at the very southwest tip of the UK. And any free time I had, I would go there and spend time in very remote places on beaches and woods and on long walks. So this is what I brought back until, um, yeah, t 10 years later, then I moved and started living there too. But um, this was the beginning. And what looked uh, still fairly thick and rough crochet got more and more refined. So I did a whole series of these stones. And what comes into this piece already, and which is shown in various pieces further along the line, is the language that comes out through combination, through combining pieces that are not just entities in, their, in themselves, but they've they already become a story. They become something that holds a whole different life and I've always collected leaves as well on these walks on uh, on my memory walks and just bringing back little objects that I I enjoyed and in the context of this ongoing project I thought can I make something to contain an experience to make a container of experience with a leaf and then this happened it looks as you can see, very rough. It's made in 2008, my first time I've ever worked with a leaf. And when I've made this piece and it sat on my desk, I had this very strong feeling that there is a lot of potential in this. And I started to go and run with it and um, experimented and made a lot of pieces, as you know, in the following years. So this was the first piece. The second piece I did was this 
very simple surround of a leaf. And for me, that was framing something that I felt incredibly beautiful and intricate. And uh, I just wanted to spend time with this beautiful object, a fallen leaf on the ground amongst hundreds of others that I've taken back. And that was something special for me, just like every single leaf is something really special. But from this very um, rough start in terms of tech the technical aspects, I it became finer and finer. The thread became finer leaf, and I worked with smaller leaves and finer, finer crochet hooks. And um, what happened in the course of this line of work is that I started thinking more and more about what it means to give something back to a leaf, what it means to celebrate the beauty. What can I do to show my reverence for this nature that a tree just produces in abundance all the time, season after season and year after year, and it gets discarded and it disappears. And I wanted to contain this, retain this and give this my absolute, um, my absolute honor. And I thought that what the craft and the finest thing I can do doesn't even come anywhere close to what nature can do with their textures, with the beautiful in intricacies that is, are shown. So if you look at very closely, if you look at the veins of a leaf, they are like intricate fingerprints. And I thought, what can I, where can I, where can I use my skill to give something back? And um, so that's why I tried. I went into what I thought was the most intricate, beautiful craft that I can produce to give back to this beautiful object. And at this point, I just thought I'd do a little detour talking about lace and the meaning behind it. Um, lace, as we know, uh, has been developed in the 16th century. There were ori origins much earlier, probably from somewhere in, in Egypt or possibly China, but it's not really known. But the first examples of lace appeared in, um, in the 16th century. And uh, mostly done with bobbins is like a type of weaving, which was incredibly time consuming. It took sometimes to make a, a collar like this will probably take an experienced lace maker about a year so it was absolutely expensive and only the most wealthiest of people could afford it and it became an absolute symbol of preciousness and status um and also what i found interesting that in um a lot of the lace at the time the language of the lace the that the imagery in lace making takes patterns from plants. It's got leaf, leaf arrangements, it got textures from plants. And I just thought this was incredibly fascinating. And that came and still is attached to lace is something that I'm using in, the, uh, as in, in my art to express what I said before to express this preciousness of what I find in nature, what I find ultimately is the origin of the lace. Um, technical aspects of the making. Um, these are uh, pictures out of crochet, old crochet books. This is actual crochet lace as opposed to the previous examples, which was bobbin lace. Um, so as you can see, what was made a lot is collar the head and that's that's the idea that i wanted to keep going with forward with to surround this leaf which ultimately is indefinitely more precious than anything that we can do because it just is so beautiful in its natural state so i carried on working trying to define make make the the, the lace surrounds finer more complicated, more more intricate. And um, so this is a very small leaf uh, and it actually had a broken corner. And I went on to this idea that out of 
something that is broken, something really beautiful can still come about. That is, doesn't need to be the end of something. It can be a really new beginning. So in that sense, that language of lace, that preciousness, that um, intensive time to give beauty to something um, is a thread that runs, literally a thread that runs all through my work. So here's a close up of that leaf. You can see um, how compared to the actual lace work in the, in, in the leaf, in the, in the veins of the leaf, that finest of lace that I can produce is nothing in comparison, but I wanted, I want to give my admiration to it by giving it my very best. Here's another example of uh, lace work around the edges of leaves. And uh, over the years, I taught myself to, to read patterns um, and I now make my own and uh, I work directly on the leaf to create these, um, these lace surrounds. Going back to the natural lace, I wanted to show you an, an image of what it looks like, what actually is inside the leaf. So this is a leaf that has been in the ground for very, very long, and it shows it shows the actual natural lace that every single leaf carries within it. And I'm absolutely fascinated by how wonderful that looks. And that is, I'm just working with leaves, but that same goes for pretty much every organic material. How beautifully organized, how magnificently present, presented every living thing is. It just never stops to amaze me. And uh, I just keep thinking about this every time I work. And going along the lines of nature is lace. We're actually all made out of lace, really. This is a, a cross section of a leaf. So if you look closely, this is a sequence of loops, a sequence of holes, just like crochet is a sequence of holes and sequence of loops. So at a, even a microscopic level, we all made of lace. Every object is made of lace in a way. This is going even a step smaller. That's a, a, a cross section of a leaf and, and, and under the microscope. And I am fascinated how much it looks like weaving how much it looks actually like stitching, knitting, crochet. It's a language that is is so multi-layered. And I've taken that and transferred it back onto a leaf. So the, the idea of taking patterns from nature and giving them back is something that I also follow along. And uh, I will go through carrying on showing you various different lines of work, various different aspects. Some of them you might have seen already. Um, they are not in a chronological order, but I've grouped them a bit more towards under topics. So this is a this is a very new piece that hasn't been shown anywhere. It's uh, it's going into my next solo exhib exhibition. There's a series that uh, I've called Time because time. Time and preciousness very much go together. Time is precious and what is precious to us and how do we spend our time? And coming from that aspect of what things look like on a microscopic level, I've taken this and it can it resonates a section through a tree trunk. It again replicates the, these images of sails and um, but for me, at the, the essence of this piece is the time that goes in it. This leaf is very small. It's about three centimeters long. And with a thread that is so fine, it takes a long time to work on a piece like this. Everything's really fragile and precarious. At any point, something can snap. So um, it raises very much the question about what is what is precious? How how do we see the world around us? How much time do we spend on it? How precious is it to us? 
Um, I'm often asked about how I, I store my leaves and how about the process. Um, collecting is at the very start of every, every work, every piece of work. And some leaves I keep for years. Some leaves I work pretty quickly after I've brought them back to the studio. But um, a lot of them are stored in boxes or I store them flat, I press them. But many of them are just hung up on a line in my studio because I like to be surrounded by them. I like to see them and they give me inspiration. They tell me their stories. They find each other. And, um, if you have a look um, on that leaf on the right, the leaf with the crack and how would that in your mind? This shows you how a process of workload. So this leaf works how this leaf was hanging on on the line for many years. And I, for some reason, even though it was broken, I couldn't throw it away. And um, this happened to it. I, I mended it and I wanted to give it a new a new life. And um, that's the finished piece, which uh, touches upon that uh, notion about what actually is life and when is it when does it finish when is something when is something done when is something finished does it move to somewhere else and in this sense it has now got a very new life and it probably would have disappeared very quickly in the normal course of nature this is a whole series of work these restoration pieces um mending restoring leaves and um again touches upon that what we can also see about ourselves how the cycle of life goes how we enter new phases how um how things being given a different context might look very very different this piece is called realignment um I find this very interesting, this subject of brokenness, of something being um, being broken. And also I get asked, so do I break a lot of pieces? Do accidents happen in the work? And for me, there isn't such a thing as a mistake or a breakage as such, because a lot of the time things can either be mended like you've seen in the previous uh, in the previous example but also sometimes new things come out of a rupture and this piece very much stands for that it just shows well purely practically if you realign something it can become whole again and for me this translates very much into that crossover where I see leaves or where I can where I feel that the leaves can be a mirror of ourselves. They can be, um, they can touch upon what we feel inside, what happens, what we experience, what happens when we're broken, what happens when something needs readjusting and um, it can be mended, it can be realigned and it can be, um, it can become something new. Just to give a bit of scale to um, what I do, it's not something, it's not so easy to recognize in frames how big these leaves are. Some of them are bigger than this, but um, as you can see, everything is, is happening at quite a small scale. This is me fixing a leaf onto its backing board. And um, there is another leaf that um, touches upon that fragility because I've, I've kept the veins here, which are the most is very delicate to work with. This series of work is called Path. Um, like we all, we all are on a path that runs a lot, that we go along in our lives, the path that runs through us. And um, you can see it goes deep within and underneath and uh, in a very, very delicate structure. I deliberately keep titles of my work fairly loose. So this is just what you see, but um, it's 10 circles. But where do these 10 circles come from? What do they mean if you take that analogy 
as a mirror for ourselves. What do we let go? What comes from within us? I just find um, my work can be seen on very many different levels. That um, I guess the, uh, there is that level that is very, very much relatable is, is the practical side of things. Um, many people know how to crochet, many people have knitted before and have an, have an affinity to that, to the craft side of, of the work, to, um, to how it's made. But at going, going deeper, stepping along from that, oh, how is it made? How, how does it work? Is that other side, that kind of um, analogy between us and a leaf, that kind of representation about individuality, about how every leaf is so different to even coming from the same tree, they're all different, they're all individual. And then you've got within leaves such a broad spectrum of colours, of shapes, of textures. And um, I just find this highly interesting to, to see that as, um, to see that in a very symbolic way. This piece, which I've entitled one, is, as you can see, not only one leaf, it's made out of several different ones. And it also shows that I don't only work with magnolia leaves, I work with all different types of leaves. Um, I just like magnolia leaves because um, they've, uh, they've got such a classic shape and I love the, the prominence of the veins on that. But on this one, you have magnolia, plane tree, ginkgo, oak, eucalyptus, beech and poplar all coming together, all bringing their different qualities but cut, but forming one. And um, I leave the interpretation to that here. Everyone can make their own mind up about what one means in that context. Here's a close up of it. You can see it's, it's almost, um, yeah, it's like, it's like seams running along the edges, joining everything together. Um, I work directly with the leaves when I find when I find my ideas when I work on my compositions. So some of them I've got always piles of leaves on my table. Um, I have them hanging on the wall, and I've got a pin board where I select things that I want to work with. I pin up examples of work. Um, it's very much a hands-on process, the development of of pieces. Uh, some some ideas stay on the pin board for for years never get made into a proper piece some of them just develop instantly some some leaves find each other into compositions but accidentally lying one one next to one another some get some come with stories and get get paired up and uh yeah and this is what i've previously shown as single leaf works and um carrying on with the notion of um they being a reflection of of relationships. Um, I'm going to show a series of works with pairs. And here again, a diff different type of leaf. This is plain tree leaves. And uh, just like Ms. Gondal has, has mentioned before, there are, they are taken into a different context. They become something new. They enter a new life. They enter a new phase. And yes, they can be seen as two leaves surrounded by crochet, but you can take it and go as deep as you like with um, with the meaning of it. Think of thinking about what it means to come together, where where this journey goes, where um, where does it lead? Where does it take us? Here, four leaves are coming together, forming a group. They've got their story together. And this is a piece very much about dialogue. It was it was actually made during lockdown, during the uh, time when um, when people were isolated from one another and kept their communication going. The um, lines of connection, even though being apart remained and it's going back onto that onto those 
microscopic lines within every organic body that kind of transports life, transports messages. And at the end, it's just a series of loops that holds us together. Here's another pair piece with a very, very little intervention, but it just shows that connection and that story between these two elements. And this is, I've shown at the beginning already, 3D piece, it's, it's, the leaves are curved and they're sitting in a, in a deep frame. And um, it's called everything that surrounds us. And as you can see, these leaves have found each other and um, became an entity. I always work directly on the leaves, so there is nothing that is pre-made and attached to them. So this you can see is like, I, I hold everything in my hand and um, it does require a lot of patience and it goes very slowly and it is very, very fragile, but that is part of the, my fascination with the work. It, it, the work requires a lot of patience, but also the work gives back. It's very calming and it's like, it's like a meditation. And I can feel it that when I'm not working for a while, I am, I'm craving it. I need to go back. I need to go back to the stillness, to the focus, to the rhythm of the craft. This is another seminal piece that um, was the first time I worked with a leaf on a branch. And I was fascinated by the connotations of it and where this could go, because it's, it's taking on another aspect and it opened up a whole new line of work with leaves on branches. And that I find this very, very interesting because it does play on, on that thought of, um, of the life cycle of where something ends, where something restarts. What comes out of something that's actually already gone a step towards disappearing and can it, can it be given a different, uh, can it be given a new life? And, um, by taking this out of context, out of its natural cycle and being being placed in a, in, in a gallery, in an art context, it, it takes the, that branch and those leaves are taking on a whole different, a whole different life. And it's the symbolism again, that comes with that belief that out of everything, something new, something continuous can be, can be born. So I've made small pieces and I've gone very large too, as you can see on this one. You can the, the photo on the right is a detail of that big, big branch. It's called Awakenings. Here's another work with leaves on branches. They come by two, two separate branches that meet and they link and they hold each other. This is a freestanding piece. And I've tried to see what can what I can make stepping away from the fact that everything has to be in frames. Because you can with this piece you can walk around, it can be seen from all different sides. And again, it plays onto, onto that, um, the notion of pairing and what it means to be connected. Here's a close up of it, of those two leaves coming together. And this is a piece out of a series called Cube Trees. Um, very simply, okay, I, it's, a, it's a branch that has cubed leaves. But behind it, for me, is a thought about our, our interaction with the natural world, our perception of it, our, our interference with it, our, um, maybe our need to put things in boxes. 
and um, I just leave you to think about more about what it meant to you. It, it means what this piece means to each one of you. Here's a close up. I also make uh, larger pieces. They are in bigger frames, and they contain a collection of little stories. Um, so this was working on a on a big on a big triptych. There's three frames, each containing twelve different pieces. And here you see me working on it, on the putting last finishing touches on the work before it goes in the frame. And as you can see, they are small versions of leaves of pieces that in variations I've done uh, separately. Different stories, different connections, different aspects. Here are some close-up views of these collection pieces. And this is a whole overview of that triptych I made. So these frames are meter high, so it's, these are quite quite large installations. And I want to end on the piece that's in in the show at the art space. Moon. It's one of the pieces of the Moon series. And uh, yeah, again, coming from the craft aspect of it, it's. Um, it's crochet behind the veins of a leaf, but also when um, the idea came about at night, looking at a tree, looking at the moon through a tree in the winter, and how each leaf actually contains a whole tree, it contains the whole life in its own little structure, and it just brought me back to where I started off with that admiration of this absolute, magnificent, intricate, tiny thing of a leaf that holds so much, so many stories, so many ideas and so much meaning for all of us. So thank you for listening and thank you, um, thank you to the gallery for including my work in your beautiful show. Thank you uh, so much, Susanna. That was absolutely brilliant, you know, uh, because you. like I, I remember we had uh, many conversations about your uh, work, about your practice before the show, but I think for our audience, this was something that everyone uh, had looked forward to uh, for, for a long time. And uh, thank you so much for, for bringing your stories and sharing the practice thank you very much. in the studio. And um, since you, you ended with the piece that is currently uh, on, on display um, at the art space, I would like to show uh, our audience, uh, for those who have not visited the gallery, uh, the installation, the way we displayed the artwork, because I think that um, uh, I the way I, I planned the display and I discussed with you before the show that you know what was my initial response to your work and the way I wanted people to see it uh, in, in, in that kind of a similar manner so I would like to share that installation picture with uh, my audience here and I just want to say I think this is an absolute beautiful way to curate it and to show it it's um, it gives the work so much space and so much way to shine it's i really appreciate the way you've you've presented it thank you thank you Susanna, and thank you for uh, believing uh, in me that you know this work can be displayed in this way and uh, uh, so i think the this work actually um i gave the maximum space to this this smallest artwork in in the exhibition and um, because i felt that it it demands so and uh, i wanted people to go uh, to the artwork go close to the artwork while crushing the dry leaves under their feet and listen to that sound and uh, get that 
contrast experience that you know while they're crushing some leaves under feet they're seeing one of them on on wall with this intricate yeah. lace work so that contrast and uh, the thing that you mentioned uh, again and again the time that how we have to uh, maybe this is you, you don't talk about all these environment and environmental issues very in a loud voice but you kind of show us a way to slow down to be empathetic with nature and you know That's just to just to exactly be, what i'm yeah. trying to do so i think that's a beautiful way uh, everyone has their own way to uh, raise voice uh, about these concerns and uh, the problems that we face every day but your way of telling people and you know sharing your emotions in a very subtle way i found i found that very very sensitive and um, so uh, stop sharing the screen now uh, we have some comments uh, in the chat box but before i read out them and i invite more questions from the audience i'll uh, this is a personal like uh, from a curiosity that you know uh, you you do crochet you you make this lace and you have shared the history of lace with us and as we know that there is a point of time when uh, embroidery crochet work has been uh, associated with feminine aspects and you know it, it, there were discussion a lot of discussion that you know uh, why only women are doing this or this is this and there was a um, uh, there is some negative aspect of it, how, how people used to look at embroidery and all this kind of textile art. And then we know the feminist movement and all as now artists more and not just female artists. I am not talking about the binaries, but yeah, people of all gender um, uh, representations are uh, working with uh, textile, different aspect of textile art. Uh, so I was curious that have you ever face any question that you know uh, because you are using that and you are talking about nature and a very very subtle aspect of it all these nuances you are talking about so have you ever faced any question that you know why crochet why going back to those uh, feminine art and and those craft um, techniques uh, if if you ever uh, faced so no i have not had any questions in terms of the pure kind of whether it's a feminine art or craft. And it's also something that for me doesn't actually come into the work because I purely see the technique, the, the technicality of it, the language of it, the um, um and and the history of what it meant in terms of of of, of preciousness. But um I think this go this whole femininity and craft work goes very much in line with the whole historic development that we've had that for example that way back women weren't allowed to study at art school they weren't allowed to to study fine art so they women traditionally went into those more craft orientated courses because society and colleges art universities wouldn't let women study fine art for example so it kind of became forcefully a women's niche but i think that recently that's been very very much broken down and there's also there's a big revival of of, of lace making and there are many men in that industry as well and um i just hope that we are on this trajectory that we will not be stopped anymore that things in in art in craft in expression are equal as they should be but yes, historically, historically, craft, embroidery, weaving, very much a women's, a women's domain. Right. Uh, so thank you so much, Susanna. Um, uh, now we have some comments uh, in the chat box. Uh, I would uh, like to read them out. Uh, Soumya Guntur is saying, wow, that's so intricate and insightful. Uh, another comment from Soumya Guntur. Uh, Wow, the work that Susanna did during the pandemic is something else. I look at it not like maintaining social distancing, but as everything being connected in nature. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, Anne is asking, do you use anything to preserve the leaf? Uh, no, I don't. Um, the, the leaf is completely untreated in its natural state. 
What I do with every work though, it's framed behind conservation grade museum glass and that glass has got a 99% UV filter because um, decay of a leaf happens through various aspects. So you have, if, a, if you take the leaf in nature, falls off the tree, is on the ground, gets exposed to weather. So it gets wet and dry and wet and dry in a con constant cycle. It picks up microbes off the ground. It gets take it gets taken over by fungi it just it breaks down through those various natural influences one big thing is the uv light of the sun which bleaches and then starts slowly breaking down the leaf which is what i'm trying to prevent as much as i can by cutting my leaves before i use them they're all washed and they're completely dried so if they're not exposed to weather microorganisms and uh, and UV sunlight, they can last for a very, very long time. Gardens have got uh, leaves in their story. It's like paper and it's like it, it's like every fragile artwork, every print, every photograph you would protect from light because this is eventually what what would degrade it. So the answer is no, there's nothing to use directly uh, that I use directly on the leaf to preserve it. So we have a question from uh, Hari Priya. Hi Susanna, amazing work and great to know the story of each piece. I have a few questions to ask. Have you ever tried crochet on uh, green leaves? Um, your freestanding branches reminds me of cobweb between the branches. Have you ever tried uh, crocheting cobweb? Um. I think I leave that job to the spiders. They make a far more beautiful work than I can possibly ever do. <laughs> and uh, crocheting on green leaves, I, if you have a green leaf, that will change over time. That dries differently. That um, I work on fallen leaves and dried leaves because I know what state they're in. They won't change. So uh, I don't crochet on, on green leaves, no. Any more question, observations from our audience? Um, you can just uh, unmute yourself and ask a question to the artist. Uh, I have a question. Uh, this is Shruti. Uh, Hello. Hi, hi, Susanna. That was a very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I have a comment actually that uh, the, the interrelationship of micro and micro, the way you you were uh, you know talking about leaves and and each leaf is also like a miniature tree, or probably you see like a landscape also in the uh, in a yeah. in a leaf. So I think I find I found that very fascinating, and then creating a structure within that leaf, which is this crochet. And I also particularly like the way you uh, you showed the uh, the uh, uh, microscopic images of 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 seeing how nature also looks like uh, as if it's woven or crocheted. So I think the presentation is really really insightful so thank you so much thank you thank you for listening and for, for watching thank you shruti uh so shruti mahajan is one of our participating artists in this exhibition um okay, we have some more comments uh, from Atiya, dear Susanna, I am totally in admiration of your work. I realized the previous visual quality of your work and I'm glad I attended um, your slide presentation. Personally, I found your work very meditative and in tandem with nature itself, your versions are one better than the other. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Atiya, for uh, joining us today and for uh, watching uh, Susanna's presentation. Um, sorry, I, I, I do, do you, do you ask any questions now or uh, just an admiration? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, do we have any, any more questions? I mean, you can make it a very informal one by just unmuting yourself and uh, talk to the artist directly. Since Susanna is here today with us, um, 
okay so i'll finish what i was uh, telling susanna is that for me it's, it's a lot of emotions and uh, nuances that to be explored that to be uh, seen in in retrospect the after after watching your presentation i think we we are all taking something with us and uh, maybe you know it will change the way we look at nature the way we look at our surroundings uh, after seeing your work or you know the way we understand time or respond to time uh, maybe that that can be changed uh, or or it's 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 just that to be not be changed in our past life but uh, at least it will make us think for a while that you know when you walk uh, so patiently meditatively with, with each beat um that's something i think uh, fascinated me today and yeah well, thank you thank you very much and uh... of, of life so that that's not to you know talk about or anything but to just to think uh, sit idly and think about it and yeah thank you so much susanna thank you for well, thank you so much for for making this possible, and uh, I I hope that everyone can take away a personal a personal feeling about the work, and it might resonate differently with everyone in a different way. But I just like the way you've described it. I'm so pleased that it it touched you in this way, and um, that's what I make the work for to touch people in on different levels. Absolutely. And I think you, know, you successfully did that uh, because the uh, work were, is still on display and uh, every day I hear new stories, you know, people visiting the gallery, they share the pictures, they, they literally spend a lot of time in front of the work, I try to understand the work, try to uh, understand yeah. the technique or explore, you know, the what it means. Uh, no, sometimes they, you know, initially from a distance they feel it's a painting hung on on wall. But when they go closer and they see, okay, this is a dry leaf, and sometimes it's it's difficult for them to believe that something can be done on a dry leaf, and that is also, <laughs> you know, uh, using a technique like crochet. So I have seen people's um, um, in reactions and the way they respond to the artwork. Uh, they look for the tag that what is the technique mentioned there or you know want to more know more about the artist uh, the practice yeah. this was a, a good conversation that uh, we had today and uh, um, so I think people who wanted to know more about your practice and the technique the process they got a chance to know from you and the, the background stories that we not always get to know from the artist directly so yeah thank you thank you Susanna well, it was an absolute, an absolute pleasure to share this. Thank you. So we have some uh, messages. Uh, everyone is thanking Susanna and the gallery for having this conversation. Thank you. Thanks to you, actually, you know, our lovely audience who are so uh, consistent all these days, you know, they're attending. Most of the people I see, you know, they're attending all the talks and um, patiently they, they, they are there. Till the end of the conversation and uh, we get some beautiful appreciation from them thank you so much you encourage us a lot um i think uh Bhargavi, ma'am uh, wants to say something i saw her unmuting herself but then uh yeah yeah so i just wanted to say you know how how uh susanna made uh, these leaves dance to her tunes the way she has folded, the way she has stitched, the way she has put everything together, and you know how how uh, uh, both the uh, on a branch, you know, there's one particular work where you know two of the leaves are intermingled, and uh, you know it's like folding hands. So that's something which fascinated me. You know, um, you have given such a beautiful life to uh, these leaves and. Uh, Making it more, uh, more like what? What do you say? Yeah. Such a, uh, a fantastic. Uh, it's a, it's a kind of a creation, uh, another world of creation. That you know, truly fascinating. And, and you know, um, uh, the way these leaves actually. You know, when I stand in front of the work, which is there uh, right in front of me here in uh, the gallery. 
it's it's like you know the wings which where uh, you worked on them it's like you know how how did she make something which is fallen on the ground which she has picked up again and you know started working on it and giving it the next life and uh, and actually they are still dancing to the tunes all of them rolling themselves full boxes it's like you know she's she's created a, a one more world which is highly fascinating and uh, thank you so much suzana yeah. for uh, uh, bringing this presentation together and um, it's truly fascinating and i want to see this again you know i really want to witness this uh, uh, talk once again and uh, and thank you atia for uh, being, enjoying the uh, being part of this and um, taking an interest to she's also another gallerist and uh, who appreciated your work thank you atia thank you so much and i really really appreciate the fact that you've invited me to take part in that in that beautiful show i very much enjoyed the other talks that i've heard and uh learning a bit more about the other artists work it's a beautifully presented beautifully curated absolutely wonderful show yes. thank you looking forward to working with you more often Oh I'd love to yes please <laughs> <laughs> yes yes so thank you thank you shum and thank you susanna thank you ma'am uh, thank you so uh, yes we we are all very very glad that you know you to uh, be became a part of this exhibition and we could show uh, to our indian audience that you know how your works really look like because i remember in on on the opening day uh, someone came to me and say you know i follow susanna for so many years and uh, this is the first time i'm i'm able to see a work in person and you know the process the intricacy i could see from from this uh, uh, one inch distance and uh, it's been fascinating so thank you so much um if we have uh, yeah. any more uh, questions here or comments Uh, i would love to take them or else we'll just conclude the session uh, but before i uh, say goodbye to you uh, the only uh, presentation that is remaining will be by chaturi nisan sala mm, that would be next week but which date and all i'll i'll definitely uh, let you know about it you will get the notification on our social media and uh, website so mostly next week uh, we'll be having a presentation by chaturi uh, but she is into many things uh, so i'm not sure the date uh, when she will be able to present uh, but before the show ends we will definitely have a presentation by chaturi uh, yeah susanna I, i think you wanted to say something and then thank you so much to everyone who came and thank you again for just presenting this beautiful show and for showing my work for the first time in india that that absolute pleasure pleasure of ours um so thank you so much everyone for joining us today and thank you susanna i mean no thank you susanna thank you <laughs> so thank you and uh, see you uh, next week um yeah yeah so goodbye and good night bye bye